you probably have the experience like I have where you come across a picture in a drawer or something like that and then all of a sudden you oh, I forgot about that part of my life and it takes you back into that, to that what your life was like in that moment and what God was doing in that moment. I had an experience like that with the church. Andrew and I were standing on the stage at South Street Campus and he was casting vision to the people that might join him here at the North Aurora Campus in the future. And I, looked, I was listening to him and thinking, I was here not long ago with Pastor Sterling, dreaming about our first campus, and all of a sudden I just had this, just a reminder from God that this is his answer to prayer. This is what he, we dreamed about becoming, a family of neighborhood churches, and it's happening. When I think about Chapel Street North Aurora, the thing that I'm most excited about is the potential for this church to really embody what it means to be a neighborhood church. This building sits dead center in the middle of a neighborhood. That there's a school across the street, there's a care home right around the corner. Even the neighbor's backyards back up to this church. And so when I think about the kind of relationships that we can have with the people who live quite literally on the doorstep of this building, it really excites me. As I'm passing through the neighborhood, I was seeing these signs of keep God close, everyone else should be six feet away. And it was very beautiful to me because it's a, it's a couple things. I'm thinking, if someone is that excited about their relationship with God and that excited about sharing that with the community and that excited about their church, that they want to put up a sign that's notifying the neighborhood of we are here, we're here for you. I just saw that that's a beautiful representation of what the church is meaning to those individuals who attend. The church is meant to be the faithful presence of God in a, in a location, in a community. God's people, long before the church was established, I mean, he says when they go into exile in Babylon in Jeremiah 29, seek the prosperity and pray for the welfare of the city to which I've sent you. And because they're there, they should be a blessing to that place. Well, that's what the church is. We're here, we're sent here. I've actually been really surprised by how quickly God is already getting at work in this community. I've had the chance to connect with the principal across the street at the school. Uh, she's connected us to our staff and we had just an amazing opportunity to start getting to know them, to, to write encouraging notes and prayers to them for how we want to support them. And I've actually been humbled by how excited they are for us to, to come here as well. When construction's happening, you sort of get this picture that there's a lot more going on than just walls going up. There's uh, spiritual work being done. We see it in the neighborhood now. God is building something in more than just the building. When I think about the success of Chapel Street North Aurora, I think is number one that this would be a place of real community for Chapel Street families. That when they come through these doors, they feel that they are a part of Christ's family. That every face that comes in here feels known, they feel valued, they feel welcomed. And then secondly, and importantly as well, that the community feels that Chapel Street is a blessing. I always think about the phrase that's become common now at our church, that we want to be a church, not primarily for ourselves, but for our neighbors. I'm really looking forward to my neighborhood church, doing service and outreach in the community, and as residents of that same community, giving us the opportunity to build relationships with people who live within the neighborhood. As we continue to expand, as God gives us opportunity, and multiply into neighborhood churches, our opportunities to meet more needs, to, re to reach more people, to make a greater impact on those that are hurting, and to do more gospel work around the world grows as well. Seek the prosperity, pray for the welfare of the city to which I've sent you. For in its welfare, he says, you'll find your own. That's what we wanna be, a blessing to the city, a blessing to the community, to this place. I get so excited seeing that video. Uh, just uh, last, this past August, we voted our annual meeting to approve the, the Fourth Campus Project, overwhelmingly to approve this exciting project to reproduce ourselves in another neighborhood church campus. And that's what you're seeing, Pastor Andrew and, and people in that community and, and talking about what God's going to do, what he's already doing. Uh, and construction is underway. In fact, that was filmed a little bit ago. You could see from the snow. And in the construction, if you visit the campus now, they're making great progress. And you'll remember, if you were part of our church family back then, uh, or even now, we've talked about this, that that was a $2 million project. And we have already had people who care about this and are excited about this, giving privately to this. We already have $700,000 committed to this project. And and we have already spent a, a bit of the design money. So the bottom line, it comes down to we have $1.1 million left 
on the goal of the $2 million project. Recently, uh, somebody who's part of our church who wants to remain anonymous, who's very, been very generous, said that they would like to present an opportunity to our church family to match 50% of what is left on that goal. So that's what this means, Chapel Street. For those of you that call this your home church and your family, your spiritual family, we have an opportunity to launch our fourth campus totally debt-free. If we can, between now and June 1st, raise as a church family $600,000, someone will match another $600,000 and will launch that campus without a single bit of debt. What an what a opportunity we have. Praise to God for what he's doing, and I know that we can do this. And so I want to encourage you and challenge you. If you're new and tuning in for the first time, uh, you know, we're glad you're with us. You're getting a little in, inside peek on who we are and what we're all about. But if this is your church family, then I'm going to encourage you and challenge you to give above and beyond your regular giving so that we can raise $600,000, which will be matched. So effectively, every dollar you give is doubled so that we can launch this campus without any debt. What a great opportunity God has given us. We're so thankful for all of your generosity and support. And I personally, I know I speak for our whole team, are so excited about what God is doing and will do in the future. Let's pray before we begin. Father God, thank you for the way that you pour out your blessing on our lives. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness, which we don't deserve and we cannot earn, but you give freely. Thank you for your work in our midst, in this church. Thank you, God, that in the midst of a pandemic with a lot of, of uncertainty about the future and a lot of negative things happening, you're at work. You're moving. You're growing our church family. You're giving us opportunities and going before us. Give us the courage to follow where you lead. Thank you for the generosity of your people. And we pray for your work that it would continue here in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and around the world. Now, Lord, we ask you to speak to us through your word, and we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, we are in the second week of our series called Living Hope, looking at this uh, letter written by Peter, 1 Peter. We're actually going to read and look, study both of Peter's letters as we go all the way through into the summer. Uh, 1 Peter's a letter written to people living uh, in, in and around uh, what's modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. They are exiles. That is, they are dispersed from uh, around the Roman world. Uh, and they're living under persecution. They're living at a time when it's not popular to be a Christian, when there's a lot of pressure just to follow Jesus in your daily life, when they feel under attack. And Peter's writing to encourage, to challenge, and to lift their eyes out of their present circumstances to give them what he calls a living hope. He says, you've been caused to be born again into a living hope which defines your whole reality. Now, there's a lot of talk today, and it's very common to hear people say things like, you know, your faith is your own business. Uh, faith is a private matter. We have freedom of religion in America, but you really ought to keep that to yourself. Or at least if you practice your religion, practice it, you know, in private or in your church buildings on the weekends. The problem is that the New Testament knows nothing about privatized faith. It's just not in here. It knows nothing about faith as a private matter and keep it to yourself. The, the New Testament speaks about this being born again to a living hope that changes our whole life, that infiltrates our minds and our hearts, that changes who we are, how we see ourselves, and how we interact with the world. So how, how do you keep hidden or you know, private that which God says is meant to define all of your life? And when we come to this New Testament letter of 1 Peter, we see Peter writing to Christians not just about what they believe intellectually or what they do in private, but how they interact with the world, how they live, every aspect of their lives. Our memory verse challenge from last week, some of you maybe have this already, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. If you're uh, watching at home or at one of our other campuses, you can say this, this with me. Ready? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now you can't tell, but I promise there's no teleprompter. I actually did memorize that. Hopefully you're doing the same. Write that down, put it on your bathroom mirror, your rearview mirror, commit that to memory. Get the truth of those words into your mind and into your heart. And if that's true, that we've been born again to a living hope, how can we just keep that private, tucked away, and not talk about it or think about how it should impact our daily lives? We cannot. We must not. So let's look at the next section, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. 
You can follow along with me. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who are through him believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is an incredible passage. I said this last week. It feels like every passage Peter writes in this letter is just packed with layers of meaning. He begins this section uh, and he says, therefore. And we, it means it refers back to what just came before. And we just talked about that. Being born again to a living hope. Kept in heaven. Uh, this, this inheritance we have that's imperishable, unfading, and undefiled that God is guarding and keeping for us. It's our hope, our certain hope. Present and for the future. Based on all this, here's how you should live, Peter says. Therefore, because of all this, here's how that translates into your conduct and the way that you live. In other words, the new birth leads to a new life. If last week we talked about the new birth, born again to a living hope, this week we're talking about that new birth leads to a new life. That's true in terms of biology, right? A baby's born, it's a whole new life. We think about all that lies ahead of that, that child. All their life will be, all the hopes and dreams we have for them. Well, that's true for us spiritually. We're born again into a living hope. The new birth leads to a whole new life, all that lies in store for us because of what God has done and is doing. You're not born again into your old life. What sense would that make? You're born again into a living hope which results in a new kind of life, a new way of living. I think we tend to think about Christianity as a way that it's like an, an add-on to our life. Like Jesus is a life coach to help us clean up our act or get our, get our life on track. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not good advice or good coaching or going to help you get on track. The gospel is a new life, a totally new life. C.S. Lewis in his great uh, classic work, Mere Christianity, puts it this way. God came to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man altogether. He's not trying to you know, repair the broken old thing, but do something totally new. And this means that a new life is a call to holiness. You heard that word holy and holiness referenced a couple of times in verses 15 and 16. That's the key image throughout this passage. This is the central characteristic of the new life, what the Bible calls holiness. Let's look at verses 15 and 16 once more. But as he who called you is holy... So you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. <laughs> There's a lot of holy going on in this passage. I don't know what you think about when you see this, this, this verse or you hear the word holy. What comes in your mind when you hear the word holy? Uh, I, I looked up a survey about this very thing. People that, uh, not necessarily Christians, were asked what they associate with the word holy or holiness, and here's what they they, they said, the Pope, your holiness, temples, incense, beards, dark churches, stained glass windows, mysteriousness, smoke, monks, chanting, and super religious or super spiritual people. <laughs> Maybe that's similar to what you think of when you hear the word holy. Well, years ago when I was a high school football coach volunteering in a high school in our, in our town, 
I really enjoyed that, getting to know the coaches and, and getting around the players, and I loved that sport, and so it was a lot of fun for me. Did that for almost a decade. Uh, and I got to know the coaches pretty well, too. I didn't realize how much of coaching football is sitting around the locker room talking about the players. And so the coaches would often go out after games, and they would, you know, to each other's houses or out to restaurants, and, and sometimes they would invite me, sometimes not. It didn't really bother me too much. I had other things going on and a family at home. But one time, um, one of the other coaches was somewhat apologetic. He was rough around the edges, and he said was somewhat apologetic that I didn't get invited out after the game. And I said, that's okay. He goes, well, well, it's not that we don't like you. We just figured you were, uh, you know, you were too holy to hang out with us. <laughs> that's what he used the word, too holy to hang out with us. But what does the Bible mean when it talks about being holy? Something very different. The word holiness here is the, is the word hagios in Greek. It literally means, the root word is to cut, but it means to set apart or separate from, to be distinct from. So when we use this word holy in application to God, we're saying that God is distinct from, he's separate from, he's holy other than, he's not like anything in this world or like us. He's different, cut off, set apart. And we see this in all over the Old Testament. Uh, in, in a couple of verses that come to mind, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. God's not like anyone or anything else. He's holy. Isaiah 40, verse 25, <clears throat> to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. God says, you can't compare me to anything because I'm different, I'm other than. That's what it means when applied to God. Holy in his character and in his nature. But when it applies to us, how do we understand the word holy? It means that we are to be set apart and distinct from the world around us. The temptation is to think that this means that, you know, that we have to be super spiritual or perfect. It's not what it's saying. It's saying the same way that God is distinct and different from the world, we who are his followers, who have been born again into a living hope, should be different as well. And I also think it's tempting and common for people to think that being holy is being uh, boring or dull, as if the people who are holy are no fun. Perhaps that's what my friend who was coaching football thought <laughs> I was. He, maybe he used the word holy to say, we just didn't think you were that much fun. Listen to what C.S. Lewis writes about this. How little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. This is so true. Jesus was the holiest person who ever walked on the face of the earth. And he was anything but dull. He was irresistible. It's been true in my experience. The most amazing, fascinating, and attracted people I've ever encountered in my life are the people that are the holiest. They're not dull. They have a different quality about them. They're set apart from the world. They're not like other people. Perhaps you've been around people like this. You sense it from them. They're not holier than thou. They're not unapproachable. Neither was Jesus. But you feel a difference in their character, in the way that they live. I remember when my wife and I traveled to London and we visited a number of churches there with some other pastors and their wives and we had the, the privilege of sitting with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel who planted and founded Holy Trinity Church Brompton. In fact, if you have the version uh, Bible on your phone, which most of us do, and you read the, the, one, the Bible in one year, Nikki Gumbel is the voice that does the commentating and writes all the, the daily devotionals. And his wife, uh, Pippa, which is a perfect British name, Pippa adds, she adds her little commentary as well. We sat with them. My wife and I and six other pastors and our wives sat in their little uh, study in, in the church with the two of them, listening to them tell stories about how they fell in love, how God redeemed their lives, where they came from. And it was, a, it was a holy moment. God was present in the character and quality of their life. There was something so spiritually attractive about the way that they lived in the world, the way they had sold out to be faithful to Jesus, a joy and a winsomeness and a wisdom that they had that was so attractive. It's holiness. It's different from the world. Or when we went to Zambia and visited a hospital in Cure, we sat with Harold and Na Hamagumba, and they were uh, they are the spiritual directors of this the, of the staff of the hospital. They work in 
incredibly impoverished conditions with people that are facing unthinkable uh, difficulties without many resources and just listening to the way they love those people, traveling uh, in a little van with them out into these, these slums to visit these families that they cared about, to bring aid to them, to pray with them, to sit in their homes with them. It was a privilege and it was a holy moment. It, I didn't feel like a holy in the sense that we're not worthy, but it was attractive. I wanted to be like them because they were different from other people in the world. So let me put it this way, sum it up. God has, God has called us to a new and a different life that should reflect the character of the one who called us. He's caused you to be born again to a living hope, Peter says, and your, therefore your life should be different and new. And holiness means to reflect the character of the God who called you. Okay, so that's what holiness means. It's to be so clearly identified with God that it's, it's undeniably distinct from the prevailing values of this world. I think this is so needed for Christians in America today, well, in the world today, but particularly in our context. Christians to be distinct, to be different, to be other than, unlike the rest of the world. In that, we reflect the character of the God whom we love. So let's, let's look at three characteristics of the call to be holy in the rest of this passage. Because I think we have to get out of our, our, our sort of contemporary secular understandings of what holy means, our misguided notions. Uh, and we, even hearing the word, we have to train ourselves to think differently. So let's look at three characteristics of, what it, of the call to be holy. The first is going to surprise you. The first characteristic is we're going to call the fight. You might be thinking, how does holiness and fighting go together? That doesn't sound like it makes any sense at all. But it's actually what Peter is saying. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 one more time. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. This phrase is crucial. This phrase uh, we're going to talk about uh, in detail in a few moments. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This phrase, set your hope fully on the grace. So to prepare your minds is to set your hope that will be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Okay, this phrase, preparing your minds for action, is a crucial phrase. The word prepare uh, there, uh, or preparing, is the word anazunami in Greek, and it literally means to gird up your loins. So this phrase actually translates to this. Gird up the loins of your mind. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's the only time it appears in this way in the New Testament. Peter's saying this preparation is, it uses a phrase called girding up your loins. Okay, but how do you gird up your loins? It's particularly the loins of your mind. What does that mean? All right, well, first of all, for those of you that wonder, wonder what girding up your loins means, uh, and I can't believe I've said the word loins like 12 times already, we're going to look at a little diagram here. Uh, from the, uh, a website called The Art of Manliness, of all things, How to Gird Up Your Loins. So in, in, the, in, the, in the first century world and, and in the old, world of the Old Testament as well, uh, people, faithful Jews, didn't, their legs weren't, they weren't wearing shorts, even though they, it was hot. They wore long robes. Uh, and in order to do hard, heavy labor or go into battle, they would pick up those robes and, do, and gird up their loins. Here's the step-by-step -step instructions in case you should ever need to gird up your loins to do some yard work or go into a battle. You pull up the robes and gather them, hoist the tunic up so that all the fabric is above your knees. This will give you mobility. Gather all the extra material in front of you so the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. Once the excess fabric is gathered in front, pull it underneath and between your legs. This feels much like a diaper. <laughs> gather half of the material in each hand, bring it back around to the front and tie it off. Finally, uh, you're ready for battle or for hard labor. Go forth, be ye men, and gird up your loins. <laughs> it's a fascinating image Peter uses here. Uh, what does it mean, though? How's he using it? The battle for holiness begins in your mind, he's saying. It takes diligent, specific, intentional mental preparation. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Transformation begins here. 
in the renewal of your mind. David Helm in his commentary on 1 Peter puts it this way, if God is to have your heart, he must first have your mind. Christians and Christianity, I I think, are often criticized for being anti-intellectual. That somehow there's there's a divide or a difference between faith and reason. Or, you know, that my religion, Christian faith, and, and being a thinking person. That those things can't coexist. But this is not actually true. Uh, listen to a couple of quotes from some Christian thinkers. Oz Guinness puts it this way. At root, evangelical anti-intellectualism is both a scandal and a sin. It is a scandal in the sense of being an offense and a stumbling block that needlessly hinders serious people from considering the Christian faith and coming to Christ. And it's a sin because it's a refusal, contrary to Jesus' two great commandments, to love the Lord our God with our minds. Philosopher and apologist William Lane Craig puts it this way, Our churches are filled with Christians who are idling and intellectual neutral. As Christians, their minds are going to waste. One result is that is an immature, superficial faith People who simply ride the roller coaster of emotional experience are cheating themselves out of a deeper and richer Christian faith by neglecting the life of the mind. One more, J.P. Moreland writes this, The contemporary Christian mind is starved, and as a result, we have small and impoverished souls. So Peter is saying to these people who have been born again to a different kind of life, he's saying the key to living this way is changing the way that you think. What's going on up here? In your mind. Christian faith is not just emotional, sentimental, passionate feelings. In in Romans chapter 10, Paul says, I bear them witness that they have zeal. Christians have zeal, meaning they're passionate, they're emotional, but not according to knowledge. They're just not thinking clearly. That's so prevalent today. I look around and I see so many Christians just not thinking biblically. And, or if they are thinking, their thoughts are formed by the secular culture, by the prevailing ideas of, of what's being thrown around on social media, by what their friends think, and not by what the Word of God says. But the, the, tr- the eternal truth, Peter says. The gospel and the Christian worldview is the best idea in the marketplace of ideas. It makes sense of the world like no other worldview does. So when Peter tells us to prepare our minds for action, he's not talking about the power of positive thinking. He's talking about the power of the risen Christ living in you to change your mind, to renew your mind, as Paul puts it. To set your hope fully on the grace that will be yours. That's what it means. To prepare your mind is to set your hope fully on the grace that will be yours in Christ Jesus. This is the the fixed reference point by which we navigate. It's the way we set our course. It dictates uh, how we think and how we act in the world. Because preparing our minds, Peter says, for action. Not preparing your minds for thinking, but to prepare your minds for action. To translate into the way that you live in the world. In verse 22, Peter says, Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth. Notice that truth is something to be obeyed, not just believed. So the way that we think is meant to translate into how we live. Holiness is not something that magically happens to you. Nor is it something that you think your way toward. But it does take mental preparation and intentional action from us. In verse 14, Peter says, Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Echoing what Paul says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. In other words, maybe you'll like to hear this. The call to be holy is to be a nonconformist. To resist. To not conform to the patterns of this world. Do not be conformed. And this means that being Living the life of holiness that God has called us to, distinct and different from, means you have to leave some things. You have to leave some things behind. We get this in life, right? You leave high school and your home and you go off to college. And then you graduate from college. My daughter graduated during the COVID class, didn't actually have graduation. But you leave college and you go off into the workforce. Or you leave your father and mother and you're joined to your husband or your wife. You start a new life. There's, there's a leaving to start something new in life that we understand. 
Peter's saying, spiritually speaking, the same thing is true. You cannot live the life God has called you to and stay rooted in the same patterns of thinking and of acting like the rest of the world. It does not work. In other words, the Christian life is not something you fit into your, your pre-existence that you find room for. It's to totally change you. And this brings us to the foundation. First, the fight. We've talked about that. It begins in the mind. It translates to action. But if we're not careful, it can feel like the fight just means that we must struggle on our own to make ourselves holy. This is not so. This is not the call. So the foundation is what? Let's look at verses 18 through 21 again. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Here's the foundation. Knowing that you were ransomed, redeemed, from your futile ways. Futile ways means your empty way of life. The foundation of your new life in Christ is not your effort, mental or physical. It's the work of Christ on the cross. The precious blood of Christ, Peter says. That's your foundation. The cross, the death and resurrection of Jesus is your foundation of this new life. It's what enables you to work, to think, to live differently. When John Kelly, you might remember, he was here during our series on justice and preached Jesus and justice when he shared a little bit of his own story. How God redeemed and ransomed his life while he was in prison, given a Bible by a prison guard. He he says he'll meet one day in glory. Never saw him again. He began to read the scriptures, living an active word of God. And in reading the word of God, he began to be transformed by the renewing of his mind. His life was changed. He was born again into a living hope. His circumstances did not change. He's still in a prison cell. But his life, his way of seeing himself and the whole world were radically altered. He began to become holy. Holy. In fact, he'll tell you the story. He changed his plea from not guilty to guilty because he said, how can I allow God, receive the forgiveness of God for my sins if I can't acknowledge them myself? Who thinks that way? That's different than everybody else who's convicted of a crime in prison. It's a different way of thinking and living in the world. So he he didn't earn his way out of that. He was transformed. And then over time, God liberated him physically the same way he had been liberated spiritually. This is the foundation. You can't buy it. You can't achieve it. Peter says not with perishable things like gold or silver. It doesn't come from anything in this world. It's a foundational shift that's happened to you. And this brings us to the last aspect of a holy life, the future. The future. What do we mean by the future? And how does it connect to holiness? There's an undeniable aspect of Peter's whole letter as we go, and certainly in these first few verses, that has to do with what we call the end times. Now, the, um, the end times, whenever you talk about the end times, Christians get weird. Uh, and, and, and wackos have hijacked this idea. In fact, I, I, I am so uh, weary of getting emails from people and reading things about quote-unquote modern-day prophets who are reading the signs of the times and telling us why this now is the moment. Do you know how many times in human history people have thought this is the end, this is the end times? World War II, World War I, when the, Ro- when the Roman Empire collapsed, when the barbarians invaded uh, the British Isles. I mean, it's just endless how many throughout history times we thought this has got to be the moment. Look at all the signs pointing to it. Is Jesus coming back? Yes, he is. is he, when is he coming back? I have no idea. It might be before I finish this message. It might be 3,000 years from now. That's not even the point. Last week we talked about being born again to a living hope, meaning how you think about the future does impact how you live in the present. Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go away, I will come back to you. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you this. So he is coming back. The point is to live now, right now, today, this moment, this week, with eternity in view. Not full of anxiety and fear, like when is it going to happen? That's not the question. The certainty is he is going to return. And I need to live my present life with that in mind. That's crucial to living a life of holiness. 
First Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, here's what Peter says. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, meaning love one another right now. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So he's saying right now, live this way. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Do you see how Peter anchors present brotherly love, love for neighbor, love for each other, with the fact that this life is temporary. It's not all that there is. It's so crucial that we get this. I think it has everything to do with how we live. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is on what is unseen, for what is unseen is eternal. I think we flip this around in contemporary American Christianity. We think what is seen is eternal. And what is unseen is unseen. We don't know much about it. It's just out there. It doesn't affect us. But the absolute opposite is true. This life, this cultural moment that we're living in, with all of its pressures and difficulties and challenges, is not the end of the story. It's not all there is. In fact, even those things which we feel are unbearable are eventually going to be blips in eternity. Just blips. They'll, they'll fade like grass, like vanish like smoke or a vapor. What stands is the eternal word of God. The good news preached to you. That's eternal. Let's go back to the first verse of this, this portion we've been reading, 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope, there it is again, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds for action now. Be sober-minded, self-controlled now by setting your minds on what is to come, what God is going to do. Living a life of holiness, a life that is distinct or different from the rest of the world, means we recognize that this life is not all that there is. And therefore, I can love freely and and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ freely because I'm, not, I'm already accepted by the God of eternity. I've been born again to a living hope. I'm not bound up in what's happening right now. It doesn't define me ultimately. I mean, I'm saying that as if I, I want to live that way. I'm not saying that as somebody who always does that. Quite frankly, I do get bound up. I do forget this. I do slip into thinking that what is seen is eternal. Living a life of holiness a life that is distinct from the world means living with the end in view. So, prepare your minds for action. Remember you have been redeemed. You're born again to a living hope. Live your life in light of eternity, knowing that God's word stands forever. That's what it means when he says you're called to be holy. Not perfect, not super spiritual, not weird, but different, distinct, because you belong to somebody who stands apart from this world. Let me put it to you this way as we wrap up. God is calling his church, both then when Peter wrote this letter and right now, in the first century and the 21st century, to a hopeful resistance in the world, a movement characterized by the renewed minds and holy lives of his people. God is calling Chapel Street Church, for all of you watching, wherever you are, to a, a hopeful resistance in the world that's characterized by the way that we think and the way that we live. Let that be true of us. Let's pray. Father God, we worship you and we praise you for this ancient letter which is so profoundly relevant for our lives right now. Lord, thank you that you have called us and enabled us to live holy lives, not perfect lives. You are the only one who is perfect, Lord but lives that are distinct, that are set apart, lives that reflect your character, the one who called us, who redeemed us, who has caused us to be born again into a living hope. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us to prepare our minds for action and to set our hope fully on the grace that is ours because of you. 
We give you all the praise and glory in your name. Amen.